and at this moment I'm talking to the uh, people on YouTube as well as the people out here in the room. Um, this lecture is going to be about assignment two of CC CCI 300, which is your industry research report. It's worth 20% of the total for CCI 300 and it's due for the journalism students only, so note that there are um, different cohorts with different um, deadlines, but the journalism discipline deadline for everybody is, oh, um, what I'm going to do now is uh, just turn my um, camera around so that it's facing my screen and note for those um, who are following along on, on YouTube that um, the PowerPoint, the PowerPoint, um, the PowerPoint I'm using is here somewhere. Yes, where is it? Interesting. Okay. I'm just looking for resources. Okay, we're getting there. So this is a really fascinating bit of live um, live television. While I find week four lecture research project assignment two. Okay, so the task for this assessment item, you are to complete an industry research report that situates your own professional knowledge and skills within the wider context of the practice of journalism today. Your report should be critically reflective and theory sensitive. In your report, you will reflect critically on personal and professional roles and challenges, including the value of diversity in communication and creative industries. Okay, let me just go to the bigger screen there. Um, okay, so I just want to um, I just want to just briefly say why why we might be doing this. Um, journalism is a profession, like medicine or music. Um, and not only that, it has very lofty ideals, a, bit, a little bit like medicine or something like that, the other professions, teaching. Um, it uh, positions itself as a crucial player in democracy itself because if people are uninformed, they're likely to make poor decisions. So the better informed people are about um, things happening in society, the uh, better that will be for um, being able to make democratic and um, good decisions. Uh, and journalists are also um, tasked with ensuring that information that goes out to people is correct, useful, fair, um, and also some other lofty ideals, which are things like holding truth to power, um, curbing abuse, noticing abuse when it occurs, um, and promoting social justice. So these are all kind of part of um, some of the things that journalism says when it's talking about itself, or what the profession says when it's talking about itself. Clearly, though, there are massive contradictions and problems in, um, in all that. So you might have these lofty ideals, but what happens to your lofty ideals when your editor says, can you run out and do a death knock, please? Um, and do people know what the death knock is? Some, no, never heard of this word, the death knock. Okay, so... Um, Sadly, it's, um, you know, there's someone's died in an interesting or instructive or dramatic way and um, you might be the reporter that gets assigned the job of knocking on the door of the family of the, of the person who's just died. Um, I've managed to get this far in life without ever having, <laughs> having had to do one myself, but I only just got out of one on one day when the editor... Um, was instructed by people further up the food chain to get me to do it, but my editor um, sort of fought back and said, she's just way too busy today, she can't do that. You know, so we kind of, in a sense, colluded to not do this death knock because both of us felt that it was ethically problematic um, in that particular case. But, 
you know, sometimes you don't have that much power. You're in a job and you want to keep the job. You might be new or whatever. So um, all, all of this isn't just in the abstract. All, all of these kind of issues and ideas about the profession actually do, um, you, you run into them almost immediately um, in, the work, in the workforce. Um, balancing lofty ideals with the practical day-to-day <coughs> reality of being in the industry. <coughs> Okay, let us go to the next slide. Okay, so clearly um, for an assignment like this, when we even talk about journalism now, uh, we're, we're, it, it, it's, it's, um, it's getting very blurry around the edges. When I first um, studied journalism, it was very clear what we were and what we were trying to do um, and where, where things began and ended. And these days, obviously, it's, um, it's completely up in the air in a good way, as well as possibly in bad ways. Um, so what you need to do with this assignment is bite off a very specific bit of um, the industry and some particular problem or issue and go deep, um, not wide or shallow. Um, that's very important. Um, sort of great big wide waffly statements um, will not really get you anywhere. It's about being very specific. Okay, all right, so um, this, this, um, le this uh, cast, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> are you allowed to answer it now? <laughs> are you confident about your ability to find jobs? No, no. <laughs> okay, you should be. You, this group of people should be confident. It's people like you who are being employed. The people who are being made redundant are sadly um, people like me. <laughs> Not that I've been made redundant, I'm doing what I'm doing out of choice, I hasten to add, but um, people who've been in the industry 20 or 30 years um, and they're expensive and they, um, you know, they've been there for a while, are being made redundant and we are now employing cheaper, younger staff. Yay! So that's good for you guys. Um, yeah, and certainly if you're, <laughs> if you're prepared to go into um, regional areas, you can probably get a job at the drop of a hat. At the drop of a hat, if you're prepared to go somewhere different in the, in the Australian continent, then you can get a job. Um, okay, so uh, anyway, that's just one question that obviously leaps out at everybody at this point, because this, this report is about thinking reflectively about yourself and the industry, so I guess for most of you, the uh, starting point for those reflections is indeed, um, is indeed the um, question of whether you're going to get a job. Anyway, I've just thrown these questions up here. In, even things like, how can you monetize a YouTube channel? Have, have, have any of you been thinking like along those lines? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, so for a lot of people now, it's like, well, it might not be about getting a job in what we now call legacy journalism, but it might be becoming, you know, a freelance podcaster or. Um, YouTube blogger, still working in journalism and doing some of those yeah. tasks, but Did in a different way. No, not at the moment, but um, <laughs> um, but for some people that it is, that's right, it, it, it is. So anything is possible at the moment, and if you position yourself in particular ways, then um, you might um, get there. Um, but that would certainly be a fabulous research question. Could I make a living from um, freelance pod podcasting? You can actually make that your research question, talk about the context of the industry today, um, and, and go for it. So um, I'm just throwing some questions like that up on the, on the, on the board. Uh, so here's some more questions that kind of are bothering, um, probably bothering you know, they're, they're exercising the minds of people who've, who've had careers or have careers in what we call legacy journalism um, because uh, things are absolutely being um, uh, recast and reformed at this moment. So the nine takeover of Fairfax is absolutely huge. Um, it's just happening right now. Um, who owns the Western Advocate? Fairfax. Fairfax. Is the Western Advocate likely to survive with the nine takeover? It's a big question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, these, these are all real questions happening right now, you know. Um, uh, okay. And the, a, a huge question exercising people's minds is the future of investigative journalism. I want everyone to be really honest, and when they came into crack 
and we knew you had to do a radio story and a TV story. Who was thinking, I'm going to do the hardest story? And who was thinking, I'm going to find a story that I kind of know a little bit about already and I think I can do this and pull it off in the time? Yes. That's the practical kind of decisions that we make. And I would have made the same sort of decision because you've got to be practical and instrumental about your life. You've got to get things done. So at the moment, is it easier to report on coals re-netting on their plastic ban, bag ban? Or is it easier to report on some kind of um, you know, new scientific information that's come out about climate change or something like that? Obviously, way easier to report on the plastic bags and coals. Um, because you, you're in a work day and you're doing it, you're doing it. So it's not about being, you know, slack or anything. It's about um, what what can be done in, in, rea in rea you know, being realistic in the day. So the problem is that, for example, investigative journalism um, is finding it harder and harder to find a spot. So that's where employers are saying, okay, you journalist, I'm giving you three weeks to get to the bottom of this. You don't have to do anything other and investigate this particularly important issue for three weeks, see what you come up with. Um, those sorts of <coughs> jobs are now incredibly thin on the ground. And I, I wouldn't say it's not necessarily at the four corners level either. Investigation might simply mean is something true or not. Um, takes time and energy to find out if a tweet has any truth to it or, you know, something you see has any, any truth. So. Um, investigation doesn't even need to be particularly high level to be actually um, requiring a lot of resources in terms of people's time and energy. Okay, so there's lots of questions about the future of journalism um, and um, I'm sure you're, you've heard a lot of them. I want to say um, there's some more questions. This one really interested me. Why was Bell Gibson not caught out as a fraud earlier? Do people remember Bell Gibson or was that a little bit before your time? Um, Bell Gibson was really interesting to me uh, because I um, am a cancer survivor myself. Yes, and she, she fraudulently posed as someone with brain tumours and she was um, getting rid of her brain tumours purely on diet and then Penguin was, was right there at the point of actually publishing a cookbook with her wonderful recipes that would cure cancer all by themselves. Absolute rot, like absolute rot, <laughs> I have to say, you know. Um, uh, and not necessarily from my point of view saying that, that, it should, that she should be censored, but she should, she should certainly have, that should have been investigated and nobody, including Pe Penguin, investigated her, her quite outlandish claims that she had not just one brain tumour but kind of multiple tumours and all this sort of stuff and that she was um, defeating them by diet alone. So it was that a failure of journalism, that was a failure of something somewhere that she got to that point and it, and it took so long um, to expose her as a fraud. Anyway, so uh, these are all really interesting questions but you may have other completely different kinds of questions and completely different kinds of concerns and that's fine because it's about you at this point, what you find interesting and what you want to um, explore in a little bit more detail. So the questions are not set, you set the question and then you try to answer it. Okay, so be a finder-outer, don't waffle and don't, don't give me 3,000 words of opinion, that would be hideous. So what it is, is it, it's a research report, so it's about finding out things. Okay. Is anyone thinking what on earth is an industry research report? Got a fair idea? Okay. Um, I might just play this YouTube clip um, just to... Uh, <coughs> Settle it in your minds a bit. See if we can go straight there. Don't go away, YouTube people. It's just firing up. A report of 
just a piece of writing that tells you about some experience, event, or situation. This could include just doing research on some topic, a practical experiment, some issue that has arisen in a company or organization, or a system, or even a piece of equipment, maybe. Reports are often problem-based, but not always. It describes what you have found out, and it goes deeper. It explains and analyzes what you have found out. Reports are very structured, and there is an expected format. They always have sections and headings. Have a look at this report online. Most reports have executive summaries. In some disciplines, we call it an abstract. They're not the same as the introduction. An executive summary summarizes the whole report. That means that there will be a sentence or two representing each section of the report. You always write it after you have completed the full report. Have a look at how the writer summarizes each main section in one sentence. As you can see, it's got a very definite structure drawn from the larger report. It is very different to the introduction, which just talks about the broad context, the purpose of the report, and what is going to be covered in the following sections. It gives the reader an idea of what is ahead. It does not give the overview like the executive summary. The other important sections are the findings and discussion. This is where you would describe and then analyze your findings. Your findings will be reporting what you have discovered during your research or your experiment or an observation you have made. In the discussion section, you must delve deeper. You have to analyze and make sense of these findings and not just state what they are. Finally, in the conclusion, you summarize your findings or use your findings to come out with a more unified understanding or outcome. In some disciplines like business, you might be asked to give solutions or recommendations to overcome a problem that you've noticed. Recommendations might have their own section or be included in the conclusion too. For more information about reports, try the tutorials. Thanks for watching. Lovely. All right, so that's a lovely, crystal clear and beautiful uh, presentation about what a report is. So hopefully that will be useful. Uh, okay. All, if you're in Word, there's... You, you say open new with template and you should be able to reply, find report with table of contents. Okay, so as I've got on page three of the handout that I gave you, this is the actual sections that you should use. Um, so these are the actual, uh, other than title page, it's obviously your title, but these are the actual um, uh, headings that you should use in your report which is handy in a way because it kind of signposts what you do. So once you've done each of these things, you kind of know you've done it. An essay is often more freewheeling than this, but the good thing about a report is it's very well signposted. Okay, I'm going to go through each of these sections and talk about doing them. And you can ask questions as I'm going through if you want. Okay, so the intro... Um, the starting point for you, um, if we think back to the question or the task at the beginning, is about your professional knowledge, your professional skills. So you'll, you'll, you'll just need to talk about yourself as a journo about to go off into um, professional practice. Um, so bring that into the introduction. Yes, you can absolutely write in first person. In fact, we must write in first person. It would be, um, it, there's no need for this sort of thing to be in third person. Even academic literature now is written largely in first person. Okay, um, okay so you, you just, you're just simple and direct about who you are, what you want to do. Um, and um, I just want to say a couple of words about critically reflective because that's in the um, task. Uh, what does that mean? Well, to reflect... One useful way of thinking about that is to be looking in the mirror. Um, so you're 
but you're also being a bit critical. And here we're not talking about your appearance, but we're talking about um, <laughs> um, critically thinking about um, where you are at this moment and where the industry is at this moment that you're walking into. You're not walking in blind. You're understanding the state of play in the industry today. Okay, so now um, um, just some things to think about the background or wider context as you're thinking about the state of play today. These are some questions that might prompt you to think that through, but the readings that I've given and the resources um, under the assignment to resources folder absolutely go on and on and on about all this stuff, so I'm not going to actually repeat it here and I think I think you've got a general idea but what you do need to do is reference it and um, you know refer to the work of others to do that bigger scene setting task and then from there you need to um, tell us what your particular research question or focus is so um, and it's very useful if you pose it as a question so the question might be can I make a living as a freelance po podcaster? You know, given who I am, given what the industry is at the moment, um, given the opportunities and the threats, you know, and the weaknesses, all that kind of stuff of me and the industry, can I make a living as a freelance podcaster? That's a question. And then you need to research, well, are other people making a living out of being a podcaster? How would I find out? So you pose it as a question. Or you might want to um, um, go for um, more heavy duty questions like, is the um, merger of mine and Fairfax good for democracy? But again, that's a really big question, so you might want to um, you know, narrow it down a little bit more um, in some ways if you can. If you do want to tackle big ideas, um, just, just try to keep it concrete in terms of your experience and the industry that you're stepping into. Um, so there, there's, yeah, so anyway, um, just think about that. Um, <coughs> now, this one, this is the bit that's probably just makes people um, go, oh, Christ almighty, what does that mean? <laughs> um, <coughs> You need to be. You need to do a literature review, and you need to be theory sensitive. Okay, so I just went a bit nuts with this. I won't go because I, I I got all interested in it myself and went on at a, at a bit too much length. But just to kind of go back over this quickly, what's a theory? We see an apple falling from a tree. One theory is because God made apples that way. That's a theory. And that would have been perfectly acceptable um, answer or, or theory, theoretical position in the Middle Ages in Europe. After the Enlightenment, the theoretical explanation for the apple falling from the tree was because of gravity. So we've moved from a religious paradigm to a scientific paradigm. And I guess we're at a university and um, our religious or spiritual views are in this context, um, it's kind of private or off stage because we are in the paradigm of scientific um, evidence-based uh, theory. Okay, so these are all theories. Gravity, the earth is round, <coughs> climate change, patriarchy. Uh, another theory, man never walked on the moon, NASA, NASA faked it. So as you can see, theories are um, based on, on, on evidence and you can argue them. Not everyone agrees that the um, evidence supports the idea, the theory of patriarchy. Not everyone agrees um, that um, the evidence supports the um, theory of climate change, although that's a very small number of people now. Um, so, but they're all, they're all theories. And a, a theory is a good theory if it can be reasonably predictive. So if you have a theory that the earth is round, one way of, um, you, you might have had that theory 
but then the thing that would really clinch it is if you could set off sailing east and then arrive back where you started. You can then say that's some evidence to do with the fact that, that was some evidence for my theory that the world is round. So um, in journalism, we actually get away with a much lower threshold of evidence than rigorous academic work, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, you know, you'll often see things like um, the residents are up in arms because there's a telephone tower about to go in. It might only be four residents that have said anything about the telephone tower, but they're noisy, they're standing at the bottom of the telephone tower, they're a great um, bit of um, vision for TV, you know. Um, so, you know, you get away with saying something like Res residents are up in arms. That, that wouldn't, wouldn't work on an academic level. People would be then saying, how many <coughs> residents? There's 20,000 residents in that suburb. If only four of them are opposed, is it, is it absolutely, you know, um, reasonable to say that this sweeping comment, residents are up in arms? So, um, for a report like this, which is a research report, we're, back, we're, we're going beyond um, the level of rigour that you see in day-to-day -day journalism, and we're looking for evidence, but at the same time, um, we are in the social sciences here, so um, most of what we're going to be doing is qualitative research, which is where you're actually finding out information about what something's like, as opposed to hard facts and figures and statistics. So I would rather, unless any of you have really fantastic statistical and quantitative survey skills, to just completely steer clear of that and go for what we call qualitative research, which is research about what something's like. Um, so um, the classic form of qualitative research is the research interview. So really, in the end, I'm just asking you to do a journalistic thing, which is interview some people, or work with secondary sources, but you're, you're, you're adding this lever, level of rigour that you wouldn't be ordinarily adding to just ordinary long-form long journalism. Uh, okay, so I just want to stick with um, communication theories for now. What, does anyone have a, f a, a favourite communication theory? <laughs> So in COM124, can you remember COM124? Journalism in context or communication in context. There was some communication theory uh, um, handed out at that time or, or, or delivered or, or discussed at that time. Okay, so um, I'm not going to go into too much depth here, and in your research report, I'm not expecting you to go into too much depth because, in fact, you haven't been spending three years doing this stuff, so you've touched on it, you know, to be honest. Um, so you can touch on it now, but what, what we're trying to get you to do is to recognise that this is, um, this is uh, how you would do a research report that goes beyond ordinary journalism. And, and you would actually refer to theory and refer to um, um, academic sources and so on. So one model of communication is Shannon and Weaver, 1949, which talks about transmission. Very simple. Um, it's just about a communication model which says there's the person or organisation saying something and they're transmitting information to the listener or the person consuming the information via some channel or other. Um, you can go into this um, YouTube clip later if you want to. Uh, the Laswell model came in and kind of, um, well not came in, Laswell proposed a more complicated um, model of communication that kind of um, set it out in more detail and adds, and, and adds things like with what effect at the end. So, so um, accounting for the effect of the communication at that point. So they're very, very traditional and very simple models and theories of communication. What is communication? What, what is the sorts of thing that's happening when we, what, what do we call an act of communication? Okay, 
But then communication theory does get um, obviously more complicated and accounts for more of the world the more you get into it. So um, I am doing a PhD at the moment, so I'm trying to explain or research the problem of climate change communication. Why doesn't it get the traction um, in proportion to the scale of the problem? So that's the kind of thing I'm trying to get to the bottom of. So one of my favourite communications theories is um, James Carey, who says, actually, the content being transmitted in the, you know, the Shannon, Weaver and Russell models isn't what's important. What's important is the rituals of everyday life. So um, people, people are not necessarily taking that much notice of what's said but they're um, engaging in rituals of, of daily life and that's, how con that, that's a big part of what's happening in the realm of communication. So, for example, the fact that we have a stock, stock market report at the end of the nightly news every time, people might not even notice what is happening in that. Is the stock going up or down? What's the specifics of it? What, what a lot of people are just taking on board, subliminally or subconsciously, is that the stock market is of primary importance in the world. Um, so that, that might explain why climate change isn't considered, I've just misspelt the word seriously there, not taken so seriously. There isn't, for example, a similar thing which talks about extinction rates or um, you know, parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere tonight. So we don't get that repetition, that ritualistic, um, continuous um, sense of what's important and what isn't important. So this theory says it's not what's being said, but it's, it's talking about um, um, the context and the ritual around what's being said. And people will pick up cues from that about what is and isn't important. There, is, there are other types of communication theories, and this one's derived originally from Marx, which is that the dominant um, ideas in a society will accord with the ideas of the ruling class. So that's putting it very crudely, and obviously people, Marxist scholars since then have been more sort of refined, you know, kind of um, fleshed that out. But um, there is this theory that um, the ideas that will get um, the most traction are the ones that also suit those who are in power at the moment. The ideas that will get the least traction are those that don't suit those who are in power. Um, another theory that's related to um, communication is this terror management theory. I might just skip this one because I'm, I'm, I'm going too detailed and I got too excited because I am doing a PhD, so don't worry about that. Okay, but there are, there are many, many, many others. And so here's a YouTube video, which again, I won't play, but it's there for you because um, you, you can grab this PowerPoint. Um, there's a, a, a kind of an outline of some communication theories. And then on, on Interact, um, where I've got that readings thing, it talks about the different models for mass communication. Um, so you can actually pick your way through some of those readings. And as long as in that literature review section, you refer to some of this theory and refer to some of the literature, that gets you out of that section of the, um, of the report. Some of you, of course, will be really interested in this in and of itself. And, you know, go for it if that's the case. Others, I, I understand, you know, you're trying to finish on CCI 300 and get out of here and get a job. <laughs> you know, so, so, you know, it's kind of where you, where you want to you situate yourself. Okay, this guy here um, does a really fabulous job. This is a 40-minute lecture, but it's really fantastic. I highly recommend just playing this YouTube lecture to um, get a really good example of how someone's talking about the media today and they're also talking about theory. So in this case, Carey's ritual theory. So at, I'm just going to play a tiny two or three minutes of it at 15 minutes in. Uh, so you can see how this guy does it. Mass 
by which those products were made and audiences were counted or imagined or assessed to the kinds of interactions among bigger organizations. Anyway, the, as I mentioned at the outset, this report yielded, at least to me, some insights, and, and that's kind of what I'd like to share tonight. And one of the key ones, the one I'd like to really just spend tonight's um, uh, time talking about, comes from um, J James Carey, who was a professor at Columbia University, the, the journalism school there. Carey's a very, a very, he's a marvelous and great guy, uh, a really good man. And um, he has a book called Communication as Culture. And, uh, is that what it's called? Oops, I should read what's on this screen. Yes, it's called Communications Culture. And in it, among other things, he talks about, he tries to disaggregate communication, the core business after all of journalism. And he says communication has two elements. One of these elements is, is the one we think about. We're like a lobster that has one really big hand and the other hand is kind of out of sight, withered away. The one that we think about most is transmission. And if you think about it in communication theory, this is this is a theory with legacy. It goes back to, to Shannon, uh, Shannon Weaver's model of communication uh, transmission. The trick is to get with maximum efficiency a message from one side to the other. And if things interfere, if there's distortion or whatever, let's mitigate that and enhance the efficiency of that transmission process. If you think of that technologically, the telegraph, the telephone, almost all of our media forms are built to transmit, to send. And that's fine. That, that enhances efficient flow of information. That's what societies need. But Kerry says there's a second dimension, a crucial second dimension, and it's called, he uses the term ritual. Ritual is a term with religious uh, connotations. Uh, and communication, he would say, is a term that has other connotations, like the calm in commonness, or communion, or community. These, this sense of being together that communication for Carrie is not just transmitting information, it's about reinforcing social bonds. It's about enforcing shared belief systems. It's about making sure we can talk with one another, not just that we're informed, but that we are together in that information space. And for him, this, um, uh, where is it up here? Yeah, so the, if you just, the lead line there, the things he picks out to talk about the where, where, where ritual resides is in this process of sharing, participating, associating, fellowship. And if you think of those terms, that's what Facebook does and does well. Facebook facilitates sharing. It facilitates the feeling of participation. It creates fellowship. You've got your, I've got my whatever it is, 500 friends or whatever. And um, so, in a certain way, the business model of social media is exactly ritual. Transmission, it's hard to know. There's not a whole lot of information passing, but there's a lot of ritualistic communication going on. And if you think of the New York Times, it's superb on trans... Okay, so he then goes on to talk about how legacy media was about much more about transmission, which is that Weaver and um, Shannon and Weaver you know, idea about what communication is, just information going one way out from the printed page out to you guys, um, and that how social media and the internet that we're in at the moment actually is more, um, actually is, tends to prove Carey, uh, or, or Carey's theory is um, better able to explain what's going on in the media today than, for example, um, Shannon and Weaver. So, um, anyway, I, I highly recommend watching <coughs> watching that whole um, YouTube um, video because it's a it's it's a fantastic um, overview of um, issues in the media right now today in the world and communication theory and completely relevant to actual practicing journalists today. Okay, so now I'm just going to get back to where we were. Um, Okay, so all, all I've, all I've, I'm, I'm, I'm only up to um, the literature review and theory section, but I've given you some hints and tips about that section. Um, I'm, I'm not going to watch, get you to watch this in real time, but Media Watch, um, which I'm sure you're all aware of on the ABC on Monday nights, um, did a big 
um, rave about the nine takeover of Fairfax and what that might mean for um, the media. So you can certainly uh, watch that at that um, at that um, link. Okay, but I will I will I will play you this one. Hi, Test News viewers. I'm Joel Schusbelzer. We're here with Tim Poole, a digital journalist who is reinventing the media world. Tim has covered conflict in Venezuela, Ukraine, Egypt, Brazil, and Turkey, and he was one of the first people to do a live news report by aerial drone. Tim, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Now, the nature of reporting has changed considerably in the past few years. What do you think is the difference between 20th century journalism and what you're doing now? I think the, the one answer everyone always gives is that you know, back in the day, a reporter would go out, watch an event happen, and then write about it, or they would go out and find witnesses and ask them what happened and write about it. Today, we're all journalists. We're all the eyewitnesses. So now pretty much anybody can become a journalist. Yeah, that's the idea. It's like uh, everyone is a citizen journalist. Or I should say, you know, a citizen journalist is that person who's out walking their dog, minding their own business when a plane crashes and they film it. You know, at any point, anyone today can become the most important journalist in the world. You know, if you're in the right place at the right time and you have your phone, sending out one sentence could, could change the world. But if everybody can be a journalist, how do we know who to trust? How do we know that anybody who's trying to be a journalist is unbiased or has integrity? That's seriously one of the biggest challenges. I, I think, unfortunately, most people just look, you know, in their Twitter profile, does it say I'm a reporter? Do they have a verified check mark? When I first started doing this, I reported from a court case in Chicago during these big NATO protests. And I was the first one out of the courtroom and I said, boom, here's the facts, bond was set at you know, X million dollars. And the response I got from everyone is, who is this guy, can we get a source on this? And so here I am, I was like, I'm a journalist, I've been covering this stuff for, you know, at this point, like two years, or for like a year and a half, and no one, no one trusted me. One day, a blue check mark was added to my profile and everyone believed everything I said. So then, what do you think is the role of media and media companies in sort of this new age of journalism? Right now, the, the key thing that these companies need to be doing, and what a lot of them are doing, is making news from noise. <laughs> uh, you know, we're seeing all these different puzzle pieces drop off these photos, these tweets. Journalists have to sit there and find that narrative and figure out what happened. You know, we can see all these pieces, they come together, and there's your story. But aside from that, one thing that's often neglected in this story about the future of media is that the average citizen is not going to investigate a corrupt multinational corporation or corrupt politicians. That's going to be a journalist with sources who digs deep and, and finds those stories. What is the hardest part about being a digital journalist in the field? The worst thing, it actually just happened to me recently when I was out in Ferguson, and this protest was happening, and it got really intense. A car like drove through a bunch of protesters, and I had no cell coverage. So at that point, I couldn't do anything. You know, uh, <laughs> people were, were sharing you know, the information with, through their different services. My service wasn't working. So it was, I, can't, I felt like I might as well not even been there. But in most of these events, you know, if you're a journalist on the ground, if you don't have access to, you know, the fire hose, to that data feed, to send that information out immediately, the information's gonna get up before, that, before you. And, you know, if you're, not, if you're not connected, you might as well not be there. You know, the other big challenge is monetization. Like, how are these companies gonna survive? Right, right. Because that whole model is completely changed now. Oh, yeah. It's, it's not just served by know, an ad in a newspaper and, you know, the stories on the side. Now there's the whole industries covering this. I think no one disagrees with this, but that's why media companies are losing money on the decline. The, I guess the scary thing is we end up seeing a lot of, like, advertorial content. A company says, hey, write about how awesome we are. And then you end up getting a, a bunch of publications that are, their advertisers are the, the people they cover. What other ways do you feel like journalism is going to keep changing in the next few years? I think live streaming is becoming a bigger and bigger piece of breaking news, and that's awesome. There's, there's never been more interest in mobile live streaming, and that means when a breaking news event happens, like an explosion, a massive explosion in China, or there might be a shooting, instead of crossing our fingers and saying, I hope, like, I want to know what's going on, where's the news, you're going to have a window into that moment. So I, I would like everybody to download some live streaming app just because you never know when you might become the most important journalist in the world. So basically, everybody download live streaming apps and become a citizen journalist yourself. Tim, thanks so much for joining us. <laughs> Make sure to check out his YouTube channel and the video he did for us about Russia. Last year, Russia's economy grew barely half a percent.
compared to 4.5% in 2010. Russia is also majorly unhappy with the buildup of NATO forces throughout Eastern Europe following the collapse of the Soviet Union. They see the increase in military bases and personnel as a method of keeping Russia subjugated. Thanks for watching Test Tube News. Make sure to like and subscribe for new videos every week. Beautiful. All right. Uh, so there's people going it alone. They're not actually employed by anyone. They're just doing it. Okay. Um, once you've once you've done your literature review and set the scene in terms of the background using some um, uh, credible sources and pre um, and preferably academic sources which you can find in the um, in the folder on the Interact, you need to decide on a on a research methodology. Now, there's a million different ways to do research in the social sciences, um, so let's not even worry about that right now. Feel free to go off on your own journey to discover that. But um, th these are three that I thought would work um, well for you, um, and, and you could choose one of these or maybe a combo of these. So your methodology might be to put together a case study from secondary sources. So see that guy we were just talking about, Tim Cook? You could actually find out by looking on the internet and looking at his blog and what's going on, you know, secondary sources, you're not actually talking to him personally. You could maybe do a profile on him and um, plus, you know, some other info, put together quite a good case study on here's somebody not employed by the mainstream media, but, you know, they're um, doing this thing on their own. That's the kind of direction I want to go into ultimately or that I have one set of thoughts about, you know, maybe I'll do that. <coughs> Um, another um, way of doing it through secondary sources might be through critical analysis. Um, so you might, for example, um, look at a whole range of tweets. So you might say, okay, I'm going to watch Twitter for two weeks, you know, on this particular topic. This is what they're all saying. So that is your research, to actually just sort of rigorously look at some tweets or look at some um, articles in newspapers and magazines and do a critical analysis where you're trying to answer your question by reading through um, some material that's in the media being published today. Um, then um, another way, another form of research you might want to use is the personal interview. So for example you might want to interview a retired journalist um, who did their whole career in legacy media and you might want to um, interview a journalist in their first year out. So say two people like that. Um, so you now have personal interviews. Um, now, what I said before about rigour, how do we know, how can we say that that's adding anything much to the sum total of knowledge if it's just one or two people? What we, what we say is very clearly, we're not trying to make really big claims. We're just trying to do qualitative research into what it's like. So it's more like a focus group. Here are people who can enrich our understanding because they have particular experiences so they can tell us a little about what it's like. But you're not making giant claims based on an interview with two people. So when you're doing a research report like this, you're being, um, you're being clear about how much or how little you can actually bring to the table in terms of new knowledge. Okay. Um, that's your research methodology. Um, section, keep it simple, keep it to something that you can do uh, in the time. Can I just use myself as a case study? I would say don't do this, I, but it is a legitimate research option and it is something that's done in the world of academia. It's often called autoethnography or different words like that, creative practice, all that kind of stuff, where you use yourself as an example of something. Um, I, I, I suggest not doing this because it just gets too um, easy to lapse into just opinion and waffle. So um, unless you think you can do a really stunning job of this, don't use yourself as a case study. Um, go and um, find out something beyond yourself. So you've, you, so that section I was talking about was the research methodology. So that's where you explain what your method is, how you went about doing your research. This next section, which is the main body of your report, so all of that was kind of like working up to this, which is the main body where you write up and analyse your findings, you give a thorough account of the data you have gathered. So for example, um, 
you know, if you if you um, were looking for, um, well, let's just say you interviewed three people, summarise and explain what the what what those three people said. But you're not just giving a list. You're not just kind of compiling the, you know, giving giving us a bold list of all the tweets that you looked at or all the articles. You're actually going back to your question and analysing how this information that you've gathered answers your question. And you might also, in the in this writing up section, go back to theory as a way of aiding or explaining analysis. Does does what you've found tend to back up a particular theory or does a particular theory not quite stand up so well or not quite so useful when exploring this particular <coughs> phenomenon that you're uh, looking at? And then your final section is conclusions. I'd, I'd skip the recommendations thing. Um, that might work in, um, yeah, this particular research proposal doesn't really need recommendations. Um, uh, but you're making a conclusion based on the information that you actually did get. Then you're doing references in APA style. Uh, I think you know how to do that. If not, look it up with these, um, with these links. And appendices are not counted as part of your 3,000 words and references are also not counted as part of your 3,000 words. Um, appendices are things like, um, you know, you might, you might put whole newspaper clippings or whole, you know, um, or, or the transcript, the entire transcript of an interview or, you know, all the tweets that you gathered or whatever. Um, so appendices is anything that might help people, um, you know, the, a thing that, that the reader can refer to to kind of get more info. Now, um, so one question people might ask is, um, there, there is a little bit of the um, question at the beginning which is talking about the importance of diversity. Um, one way of um, interpreting that is the importance of um, diversity of, of um, voices in the media. Um, so, for example, if the media is continuously concentrated into fewer and fewer hands, um, that might have, um, that means that fewer different voices, you know, get a chance. Um, you can also interpret that as well or instead um, as diversity issues in terms of, you know, um, uh, cultural diversity. So, um, you know, is, is, is the transmission model, um, for example, you know, where you're just telling people about the world, if it's all written by white people, are you really going to get that many um, fabulous stories that use, say, the perspective of Indigenous people? So, you know, you might want to say something like, you know, Facebook and Twitter have actually opened up incredible spaces for more voices and, and cultural diversity, um, you know, through all these different ways that voices are coming through. Lots of different ways of um, covering or acknowledging that element of diversity. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, and again, you can, you can research that um, and, that, and there's a lot of material on the internet about, about <coughs> cultural diversity and the media. Okay, so um, that's, the, uh, that's the end. So that's been a 54 minute lecture. I'm gonna go off live stream now. Hang on, I'm just gonna turn this around. Thank you very much to uh, YouTube land for watching this lecture. I'm, congratulations for getting this far and good luck with your assignment. Okay, bye.